I mean, they disconnected, but it just disconnected again. Um, so, uh, you've been on an emotional roller coaster, haven't you? You know, where you get excited and then not so much. Now, a lot of times the emotional roller coaster is when people watch uh, like football, you know, <laughs> or, or when they uh, selected their brackets, you know, in basketball, which I've never done. Uh, basketball is a tall man sport, and I resent them. And so they didn't have basketball when I was a kid, so, you know, it's a fairly new sport. So uh, any, anyway, anyway, people just get excited, and, and actually when your team loses, sometimes people get tearful and, and, and they fret. And so you get happy, and then you're, not, and then you're happy again. Well, you know what it's like. Well, the, the uh, Israeli elections, I found myself to get really invested in those on Tuesday afternoon uh, because Tuesday, uh, they're seven hours ahead of us. So uh, I started watching around 2 o'clock in the afternoon and, uh, uh, you know, trying to get some studying done. You can't study when you're watching the elections. And uh, so it was 9 o'clock there and the polls start closing. And then, uh, and then the, the liberal guy, Gantz, he gives a victory speech because the exit poll said he won. So he gives a victory speech. Uh, their exit polls are worse than ours. So he gives the victory speech and, um, uh, you know, just really, just really rubs it in Netanyahu's face, you know, during the victory speech. Because the problem was he didn't have enough people to form a conservative, I mean, a coalition, because you need your party plus other parties. You've got to have a total of 61 to control the Knesset. And he wasn't going to be able to have that, but they projected that he had uh, as many as three more Knesset seats, his party, than uh, the Likud, Netanyahu's party. Well, it turned out to be backwards. <laughs> And three hours later, Netanyahu gives his victory speech. And, and so I, I've got um, 13 news sites I look at. And I got them so that when I say open the tab, they all, they all come across. And I'm looking. And the liberal, the liberal papers, uh, they're all saying, no, he probably doesn't have it. And the conservative papers say he probably does have it. And it turned out to be the conservatives they were. So it was, for me, it was a roller coaster. It, it was one of those things where uh, when Gantz is giving this, I'm going, really? And, and i tell you why it matters. Because everything that has been done that we as evangelical Christians get so happy about because it fulfills the prophecy that we see in Scripture as being necessary to fulfill. And so uh, Gantz would have turned all of that back because he's liberal and they would have immediately tried to negotiate and give um, uh, land back to the Palestinians and two-state solution and, and all of this. And so I was, I was as disappointed probably when it looked like it was turned against us as probably anybody because you look and you say, this is God's time. And then you look and you say, well, maybe not so much. Now, let me just say, let me just say, Netanyahu is, I think, God's instrument in Israel right now. Now, he's got a lot of flaws. He does have a lot of flaws. He's a, he's a seasoned politician. This is his fifth term. It's a record. And so if you start telling me all the bad things about Netanyahu, I'm going, okay, na 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 I know he's got bad things. But, you know, I look at it this way. It's, it's what I see that God wants to do, and then who in this world is facilitating that? And today it seems like it's Netanyahu. So, you know what a roller coaster ride is like, and we've all been on those roller coaster rides. Um, the um, youth, by the way, in Israel, turns out they're conservative. Who knew? Uh, they are more conservative than their parents because they've been in the army and uh, they know that they got Syria on 
the northeast. They've got Lebanon on the north. They've got um, other countries. They got Egypt, which is eh, okay right now. A, a lot of the Jordanese, uh, they Jordanians, they aren't uh, keen on Israel, but they'll tolerate them. And so, and so it's it's a tough it's a tough thing when you're surrounded by enemies in Iran. They're moving into Syria, trying to, and and so so it's it's really quite notable that uh, we've got a generation of young people that are looking at war all around them. They're saying, "Yeah, no, 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 we're conservative. We're not going to be giving back any of that land. No, we're just not going to do that. It's not it's not who we are. It's not going to work. It's not what we believe in." And so it turns out that they are conservative. So here we are, a few days before the Passover festival. And Jesus announces to his disciples that they're going to Jerusalem to celebrate. Now, every time that Jesus has gone into Jerusalem, um, and I don't want to make it sound like it's all his fault, but every time he went into Jerusalem, he caused a ruckus. I mean, every time. And so the disciples, they're wondering, well, what's it going to be this time? And so here, uh, I'm sure there's, you know, it's like, uh, you know when you anticipate a vacation and, and you're always scared that you didn't pack enough. And then it turns out that you end up packing too much. And uh, so that's, that's a situation right here. They, they say, we're going to Jerusalem. Uh, boy, we've had to run for our lives the last few times. But uh, maybe it'll work out this time. But then Jesus gives them the talk, and here's what he says. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge, and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. So if you're one of the disciples, you're saying, you know, you know how you encourage people when you don't have any idea. Oh, you're going to be okay. I, hey, you know this. A sad thing happened to me when I was in the at Tennessee Temple. Uh, there was a guy I had classes with named Brian. He's married, um, had children, and uh, he's he's diagnosed with brain cancer. So I start going, you know, to the hospital to see him, thinking he's going, you know, a couple times a week and. His wife is there, and I'm telling his wife, he is not going to die. God's going to deliver him. God's going to bring him out of this. And, and then one day she looked at him and she says, how do you know this? Uh, I got faith. He died. And, uh, you know, I began to realize at that point, um, yeah, you want to be encouraging, and, and yeah, the, you, you, the, in the movies, the, the guy that's been shot and is bleeding real bad, and he says, you're going to be okay. Yeah, no, he's not going to be okay. So the disciples, they're listening to Jesus talk here, and Peter earlier had rebuked him. He says, no, Lord, forbid, no, no, this can't happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. So Peter noticed he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't speak up here, because <laughs> he... He knows that eh, it's probably not going to be such a great vacation, but still they can be hopeful. Still they can hope that it's going to turn out for the best. Now, when we go through some, some uh, timelines right here, keep in mind that tonight at 6 o'clock starts Monday in Israel because their days start at sundown in the evening. So it'll click over. Six o'clock tonight is really Monday. So when we're looking at our timetable, it's important to kind of understand that. Not kind of, but it's important to understand that. So on their way to Jerusalem, they stopped by Simon the leper's house. What a name. You know, we're not told how he got the name, but I'm guessing he'd been a, le a leper. And you know, it'd be just, you can tell me, you can tell me you're healed if you want to, but I'm probably still not going to want to shake hands with you. You know, Simon the leper. But Simon the leper is kind of a wealthy guy. 
And so uh, Simon the leper also, and uh, apparently these Gospels were written much, much later, you know, uh, decades after the events happened right here, because Simon the leper also had another moniker that he could have gone by. He was Judas Iscariot's father. So would you rather be known as Simon the leper or the father? Yeah. Yeah. Go, go for the leper. Well, this is a raised from the dead party is what this is. I mean, it's really back in chapter 11. Jesus had brought Lazarus, who'd been four days dead, and he stinketh, and brought him out of the tomb with his grave clothes on, and everybody's going, oh. and the Pharisees, he was friends with some of the religious leaders. You'd, be, you'd think they'd be happy to see their friend come out of the tomb. No, they were not happy. As a matter of fact, we'll see in the passage right here, that in verse 10 right here, that they consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. It's not good for business if Lazarus is up walking around and Jesus did it. So what happens at this at this party is Mary and Martha, who were the sisters of Lazarus, Martha is serving food, and Mary goes into another room and comes out with $30,000 worth of oil of spikenard. It was a, it was like, a, it, well, today it's an essential oil, is what it is. But it's very expensive, and uh, it's it's in a container. and And uh, Judas says it's worth it's worth uh, three hundred pence. Three hundred one pence was a common laborer's uh, uh, work for twelve hour a day, and he gets one pence. So we're talking about three hundred common laborers days worth of work, estimated to be. Twenty-eight to thirty-five thousand dollars on today's market. She goes and gets it out and breaks it open and pours it on Jesus' feet, and then and then starts wiping the feet dry with her hair. Now, uh, if I'd have been there, I've been going. I mean, you you got to admit, now, you, and you know when we read it, it, it's hard to really, you know, get the just awkward. I mean, am I right? Would that not be really, really awkward? You got the twelve disciples in there, and uh, one of them speaks up though. Now it says some of them were agitated with the waste, but one of them speaks up. You know who it is? Jesus Iscariot. You could have sold this for thirty thousand dollars and fed the poor. Well, he's wiping your off your feet. With, so Judas he's noticeably irritated. But on the next day, the reception of Jesus in Jerusalem is amazing. Now, to get the setup here. Lazarus was from Bethany, which was uh, less than two miles from Jerusalem on the other side of the Mount of Olives. But he was well known by the religious leaders. And so now you got a guy walking around saying, hey, you know what happened to me? You know, you know what happened to me? I didn't just die on the offering table and they resuscitated me. I was dead for four days. I had been buried. I stank. And look at me now. I'm as good as new. Now, that's interesting. And that's pretty upsetting to, um, to the Jewish leaders. To the point to where, in this chapter, verse 10, they thought about maybe we'll just, we'll just kill him. We'll just take his life. So on the next day after that episode, it's Sunday. It's Nice and ten on the Jewish calendar. 
the Passover is nice and 14, the day they kill the lamb. This is nice and 10. It's a Sunday. And on this Sunday, Jesus arranges a donkey ride. They go get the donkey, and he's riding into Jerusalem. The people are pumped. I mean, the people are pumped to the point the guy that resurrected Lazarus out of the grave is coming into Jerusalem and the streets were lined with people waiting for Jesus to come through. I mean, sure, why wouldn't they be? And then, here they come and Luke reports that he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. I'll show you that in just a moment. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. If you read all the reports of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see Hosanna means King. They are pronouncing Son of David, King of David. Uh, uh, David's king, they are pronouncing Jesus to be that Messiah going into Jerusalem, coming down the Mount of Olives. Now, if you're on the west side of the temple and looking east, that's the Mount of Olives. Now, several of those houses weren't there at the time. <laughs> Just saying. But I tell you what's the same. If you're in the city of Jerusalem, you can look up and you can see the Mount of Olives. And you can see this crowd gathering. And you can see they've got both sides of the streets lined. And they're, and they're chopping lee, limbs off of the trees and throwing these palm leaves down on the road. And they're sewing their clothing, their jackets, their suede jackets. They're throwing those down on the road right there as Jesus comes down. And they know the path he's going to take and their religious leaders are looking up saying, whoa, we got problems. Now if you're on the west side of uh, the Temple Mount, then that, by the way, is the western wall. So look over the Dome of the Rock, which wasn't there when Jesus was there. That's the Mount of Olives in the background. So they're looking up, they're seeing all that. If you're up on the Mount of Olives, here's what Jesus and his disciples are seeing. They're looking down, and they're seeing, instead of the Dome of the Rock, they're seeing the, the Solomon's Temple right there. The Herod's Temple. Big old temple sitting there. They're clean down. The people that line the streets on, on the Mount of Olives, they're looking. There's Jesus riding on a donkey. The temple probably looks something like that. Now, when you're facing the temple from the east and looking toward the west at the, at the eastern gate, see it down there at the bottom on the right, when you're facing it, there's a big valley in front of it. So probably the entrance was from the left or the south, and the south was where the the uh, the uh, the south was was where the city of David was. So they probably came through the city of David, and then took that path, that path, and followed it up, and uh, went into the temple gate, the eastern gate, that way. Oh, it's exciting for everybody except the Jewish leaders. So you can see on the, uh, on the right side there the path leading up to the eastern gate. Bethany was where they had been and that's where they're coming from. And Bethany is off to the east on the, on the back side, on the eastern side of Mount of Olives. So they went ascended some to the, on the Mount of Olives and went down and started descending into Jerusalem and they're looking and they're seeing and, and they're concerned. 
Mark 11, 11 tells us that Jesus visited the temple on this Palm Sunday on his best conduct, which is not the case the next day. And then he went back to Bethany that night. Now, you can conjecture as to why he went back to Bethany. Uh, all the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem wanted him dead, so that would be one good reason. So uh, we're told in Mark 11 that that night he went back to to Bethany. The next day, Monday, Nisan 11, Jesus goes back into the temple and thoroughly cleans it. Now, you know what I mean when he cleanses it. He turned over the money changers' tables. He, re he, he, just, he, just, just, he tore it up and uh, ran the people out. You know, he's, he, he's got uh, uh, probably Pharisee or holy-looking clothing on, priesthood clothing. So they're, they're responding. And I'm guessing that Jesus is probably a big man too. They're responding, they're leaving, and uh, he thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly cleanses the temple. Now, by the way, this is not the first time he done that. Back in John chapter 2, at the very beginning, the first Passover, he went there. He did the same thing back then. So this is number two. And he throws them out and says, My father's house should not be a house of merchandise. So, uh, Naturally, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all report on this and uh, show how upset that the people are because of what Jesus is doing. That evening, Jesus goes back to Bethany, we're told in Mark chapter 11, verse 19. It's probably a good idea, right? Because we're saving ourselves for nice and 14, the day that the Lamb is slain. And here we are, we're still on the 11th. Now, Tuesday, next day, 9th and 12th. Jesus sits on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem and he gives the prophecy concerning the tribulation, the second coming. It's all there. It's the, it's the most significant prophecy we have in Scripture. Jesus talking about things to come. And that's on the Mount of Olives two days before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And the disciples are sitting there listening. What must they be thinking? They're going, okay, we had a good day on Monday, on Sunday, really good day on Sunday. Monday there was that temple thing, but he lived. We got to go back to Bethany. We walked out. Uh, Tuesday, now here he is, he's talking about things to come and prophecy and the Son of Man coming. And Don't you think the disciples are at this point a little confused? They're going, so how do I feel about that? It had to be an emotional roller coaster. We're up, then we're down, then we're back up again, then we're back down again, but here they are. He had said when we go to Jerusalem, you know, one of us not coming back. It's me. So at that point, they're probably on a high listening to Jesus give this. But on Wednesday then, they are directed. It's the 13th of Nisan. They are directed to find a place to have the Passover meal in Jerusalem. Now, here's what's different about this. The Passover day, nice and 14, that's the day you kill the lamb. It's not a no work day. It's a work day. That's the day you make the Passover supper. You kill the lamb. And so here we are on Wednesday, and Jesus tells the disciples, tonight, which will by the way be nice and 14, Tonight, we're going to have the Passover supper. Everybody else is going to have the Passover supper the next evening. But Jesus and his disciples do it that evening. Because the next evening, Jesus will be occupied. 
So here they're told on this Wednesday to go find a place to have the, uh, the Passover. On the Hebrew calendar, Nisan 14, the day the Passover lamb is killed, begins at sundown on Wednesday evening. That's important to get that. I know it's confusing. It's always uh, uh, when I text some people that I know in Israel, the ones that are observant, um, uh, I think the one guy that's observant that I met on the train that time, that's the yeshiva student, he found him a gal that doesn't look so observant to me. And I think he's not observant anymore. <laughs> but, but anyway, I have to ask him delicately somewhere along the way here. But, uh, but, but anyway, so, so here are the, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the Sabbath, sometimes I'll text them on Saturday, knowing that they're probably, I'm not going to get a reply till you know, 7 o'clock that evening, uh, their time. Uh, because they're going to not text, because, you know, that's making fire on your phone. They're not going to text. So Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. is when Nisan 14 begins, and that becomes the day that the lamb is, is, uh, is killed. The lamb, the Passover lamb that everybody brings, that everybody observes, that Passover lamb is killed on Nisan 14. Now, by the way, on Nisan 10, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, today, that was the day that the lamb is picked. The lucky lamb. Hey, little fella, you get to be this. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it'd be okay. No, 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 no. Uh, that's the day the lamb gets picked. And that was the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. So here we are in Nice and 14, and Jesus and his disciples, they're going to eat the Passover that evening. They're not going to wait till the next evening. Now, I should point out at this time that the Roman Catholics have a really, really tough time with, with timing and calendars. Uh, back in the 6th century, the Pope called a guy named Diognisius Exegus. He was a mathematician. And Dionysius was commissioned by the Pope. He said, we want a new calendar based upon the birth of Jesus. Because up to that point, the calendar had been based upon the founding of Rome. And so he said, we want a calendar that's based upon the birth of Jesus. So Dionysius, the mathematician, went to work. He came up with a calendar and he brought it back. And the Roman Catholic Church adopted it. And if you look in your Bibles that have dates, it has Jesus being born 4 B.C. So Jesus was born four years before Christ. And the reason is because Dionysius didn't just make one mistake, he made two mistakes. He went from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. and just counted it as one year. Oh, and how does a mathematician, what kind of math did he teach? <laughs> <laughs> it was new then. But <laughs> and the second thing that he didn't account for, of course he was a mathematician, not a theologian, but the Pope should have caught it, is that, uh, is that Herod was alive and tried to kill Jesus. And so what they, the calendar that he, that he formulated was one where Herod was dead when Jesus was born. So they're saying, oh, that's not right. And so immediately the calendar is wrong and has been wrong ever since. So why didn't somebody correct the calendar? How are you going to correct the calendar? It's, it's, it, it, it's bizarre. Now, if you look in all the Catholic commentaries, they still got Jesus being dying 33 A.D., not possible. Jesus actually died in 29, uh, between 29 and 30 A.D. because he was born four years before he was born. <laughs> now, I said all that to say this. The Catholics centuries ago said that Jesus died on Friday on the cross. And, and it, was, it was accepted for hundreds of years. But scripturally, when you look at it, it's 
just not possible. Scripturally, it is just not possible. Because we can account for every day from actually the uh, Sunday, Palm Sunday, down through the day that Jesus was crucified. We can account for what happened with Jesus every day of that week. However, the Catholics, they say, the life of Jesus was silent on Wednesday. Now, now can you imagine the most memorable week of the world, the week that Jesus was crucified. And they want to tell us that nothing happened that was recorded about Jesus on that Wednesday? No. Because that was the day that they prepared the room and that evening they killed the sacrifice and that night, which flipped over at 6 o'clock to nice and 14th Thursday, that's the day when Jesus was crucified. I'm going to show you how they missed it. The crucifixion sequence is this. Nice and 14, kill the Passover lamb. Jesus had to be off the cross before sundown on Thursday evening because of the high Sabbath. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Friday, nice and 15, is that high Sabbath? And I'll show you the verse, John 19, 31. That began Thursday night after sundown, and it's called the first day of unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Saturday was the regular Sabbath. Sunday was the first day of the new week. Now, Jesus had prophesied in John 12, 40. Here's what he said. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, you know that story, right? Out of the book of Jonah. So must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. They say, oh yeah, but it's like it's like Motel 6. You know, you... You get three days and two nights. It's just, it's just, no, it's just three days. Listen, Friday night, Saturday night, and then Sunday, that's two nights. Jesus specifically said, i got to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If you want to know about what that means, go to Ephesians chapter 4 and Bible track and read all about it. Got uh, uh, very specific notes about where Jesus was for those three days. So, here we then have the Friday being the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was a week-long feast. They had their supper, their Passover supper. It's nice and 14, Thursday, I mean Wednesday, they killed uh, Thursday. They killed the lamb during the day. And that evening, it's a no-work day beginning at 6 p.m. And that's when they ate the Passover supper. Jesus and his disciples ate the Passover the day before, the evening before. Now, John 19, 31, when it's talking about Jesus being on the cross, remember they said they have to get him down because of the Sabbath day, it's coming, you know. And by the way, if you're in Jerusalem, um, it's 6 p.m., but forget about getting anything done or buying anything after about 3 p.m., because... It takes them three hours to shut down, and so boom, there, you know, nothing. Nothing in Jerusalem. And now since the ultra-Orthodox are going to have more power in Jerusalem than they did before, they're going to, they're going to lock Jerusalem up tighter than you can imagine on the Sabbath day. But anyway, so they say we got to have Jesus off because we have to have him off before the Sabbath. Well, the Catholics got mixed up on that. And by the way, most people that have just said, you know... We won't be able to sell our books and our writings if we don't go along with the Catholics on this because it's been this way for centuries. But here's what that Friday was. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. For that Sabbath was a special Sabbath, a high day. They they called special days, no work days, they called them a Sabbath because it was a rest day. And so that was Friday. You had actually back-to-back Sabbath days. Friday was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Saturday was the regular weekly Sabbath. So they weren't trying to get Jesus off the cross in time for the regular weekly Sabbath, which was Saturday. They had to take him off the cross. And that verse has always been there, but I don't know why it was, been, it was ignored for all of those years. So rag- Saturday was the regular Sabbath, back-to-back Sabbath. 
because of the high day of John chapter 9, verse 31, 19 to verse 31. So after trials through the night, Jesus placed on the cross very early on nights and 14, the same day the Passover lamb is slain. Think about it. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Jesus had to die on nights and 14. It couldn't have been the 15th. had to be the 14th. And uh, that, by the way, was Thursday. Now think about it. If the Passover, if the, if the uh, Palm Sunday was the 10th, and it was, then it had to be that, if you do the math, Thursday's the 14th. And that's when Jesus Christ was slain. Our Passover lamb. Jesus paying the cross, the death on the cross for us. Jesus had to be removed from the cross before the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That began at 6 p.m., so long about the afternoon. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost about 3 p.m. On, uh, on Thursday. Feast of Unleavened Bread starts that evening at 6. Got to have him off the cross. Got to have him buried by that time. Here's what everybody agrees. Jesus arose from the grave on Sunday morning. So next week, whatever day you think Jesus was crucified, everybody agrees that Sunday is special for us because that's the day that Jesus rose from the grave. That's the day the victory is won. That's the, it's not as much the death had Jesus died and stayed dead we'd have no hope. But Jesus, first of all, brought, brought Lazarus out of the grave, and secondly, he brought himself out of the grave. He proved to us that he has power over death. So don't let people get you hung up on all of the, the, the things they see in Genesis that they doubt. And don't, don't let people say, look here, look here, here's what I know. There's power in the resurrection. Yeah, I believe everything in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. And that happened on Sunday. I heard a preacher uh, years ago and uh, talking about how depressed the disciples were. And they were. You read after Jesus was crucified and, I mean, they were depressed. They were just beside themselves. They... But then he says, somebody must have stood up and said, yeah, but Sunday's the coming. <laughs> well, he said three days. And by the way, if it was a Friday, they're probably trying to figure out, so is it going to be a Sunday or a Monday? What, what is it? <laughs> no, Sunday. Sunday's the coming. Next Sunday's coming. And you know, it's amazing that when I was a kid, uh, I remember one, one time my mama, she hated preachers, she hated church. But some neighbor got us to go to church on Easter Sunday. Because you can get people, you can still do it, you can still get people to go to church on Easter Sunday where you can't get them to go any other time of the year. Uh, that's where the power is, the power of the resurrection. And that's why, listen, the power of the resurrection is celebrated next week. Let's bring some people to hear. Let's bring some people to see. Let's, let's, let's invite our friends, people that maybe you think, ah, they're not going to say yes. Invite them to come. Say, come on, let's, let's go to church. I want, you to, I want you to see my church. I want you to hear my preacher. I, w I want you to hear our choir. I want you to see what we got going. I want you to see that we love Jesus Christ because we believe that Jesus is the power of this world. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.